Do you have an idea for a new ministry but aren't sure exactly where to start or how to get it off the ground? Do you wonder how to help leaders in your ministry context start new things in ministry? In today's episode, we're talking with Dr. Michael Bender about steps to take when starting a new ministry, whether that be within an existing church or a new form of Christian community itself. What are some pitfalls to avoid when starting a new ministry? The most common hangups people have when doing so and how to join the Spirit's creativity as God brings forth new life in and through us. Hello everyone, I'm Dwight Shiley. And I'm Alicia Granholm. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. We are really excited to have Michael Binder with us today. Michael is Assistant Professor of Congregational Mission and Leadership at Luther Seminary, co-founder of Mill City Church in Northeast Minneapolis, co-author of Leading Faithful Innovation with Dwight Shiley and Tessa Pinkstaff, and with his wife, Carissa, the owner of a fourth-generation family small business. Michael is also the instructor of our on-demand course, How to Start a New Ministry, and helps lead the Seeds Project, Luther Seminary's Incubator Accelerator for Ministry Entrepreneurs. Michael, welcome to the Pivot Podcast. Glad to be with you guys today. Thank you for having me. Michael, your own experience starting a new ministry began in college when you began a Bible study in a college campus environment that was not altogether hospitable to Christian faith. Share that story with us. Yeah, that's right. I was uh, going to college at Carleton College in Northfield, a great school. And when I arrived down there, I realized that Christianity was not the norm among the student body. And there wasn't really a Christian culture, so to speak, down there. Uh, and in my second year there, a person from my home church came down and invited me to start a Bible study, which I barely knew what that was. But uh, I learned pretty quickly it involved opening the Bible up with a few friends and talking about different passages and just sharing what we were thinking about it and praying and trying to grow as Christians. And so we started a Bible study there and just with three people. And I remember even in that first experience, we got some kind of side eye looks from other students who thought it was kind of weird that people would get together and read the Bible in a place like the student center. But we kept doing it anyway. And we just had this incredible growth from three students all the way to uh, it was either seven or eight by the end of the year. It's just like crazy doubling high percentage growth for this for this Bible study. <laughs> Um, but what we learned over the kind of three years from my my sophomore year to when I graduated was that there were a lot of students, even though they didn't have Christian backgrounds, who were really interested in the Bible, interested in spiritual things, uh, and came part of our group just as a, an exploratory discussion group centered on the Bible, very open, all kinds of ideas shared. Over that period of time, we really saw the Spirit of God shaping people's lives and their understanding of Jesus and their willingness to be open to what God had for them in their lives and calling in their future lives outside of college. And uh, and I was just overcome by the time I graduated with awe at what God could do in a place that kind of seemed like it wasn't that interested in Christian faith at all. Um, and that group really had a life of its own, it actually lived, has continued to live on for now over 20 years in different forms. And it became really clear that that was something that God wanted to happen in this space. It wasn't a plan I had. I didn't go to college thinking I was going to help start a college ministry. Uh, I didn't even know how to do that. I didn't feel prepared to do that. But it um, it was really an amazing experience to see uh, how God has something in mind. And sometimes you get to be part of it whether you knew you were going to be invited into that or not. So you went on to co-found Mill City Church in Minneapolis. What are some things that you learned in that process? Yeah, we, Stephanie uh, Williams O'Brien and I planted Mill City Church um, along with my wife, Carissa, 2008. And some of the key learnings from that experience uh, were how to wait in a kind of geographic space to see what it was that the Spirit of God might be doing there. And when we started that church, we had a vision for it that was very uh, space-oriented, ge geography-oriented. So the idea behind it was, we think God is already at work in this part of the city of Minneapolis, and we feel called to help start a new church 
that will join in with whatever that whatever that is that God cares about, that God's doing. And those are super hard questions in some ways because they're vague. You know, like who knows what God's doing in Northeast Minneapolis? And we didn't know at the time. But um, it became very clear, even as Stephanie and I formed a friendship over this work together, that this was really something God was calling us to do. So probably the first learning is there are a lot of good ideas for new ministries, but there's only some that God is actually inviting people to do. And that's a really important distinction, kind of the distinction between just, you know, any kind of startup idea and a spiritually discerned startup idea. And often when I talk about this with people, I say, you know, you you know it's an idea that God is giving to you when it keeps coming back around in your life over and over and over again. I spent years thinking about starting a new church, trying to avoid it, coming back to it. And when I looked back at that period, I could see God putting people in my life, conversations in my life, experiences in my life, even dreams in my life that kind of compounded to help me feel sure enough that this was something that God wanted us to try. And often you need that kind of confidence in order to try some things that are risky because you don't know if they're going to work out and there could be a lot at stake for for trying them out. So, you know, getting clear about what it is that God's actually inviting you to do really helps. You can pray about it. You can talk to other people about it. You can try some small versions of it to see how that goes and see if that clarifies and confirms what it is you're thinking you want to do. Um, But as we got into that, then we learned some practices for helping a small group of people. We just had about 20 people or so to start really get into a space. So when you when you start a new church, some of you who are listening to this maybe are familiar. You know, you often find a worship space and you get a group of people and you you start worshiping there and try to invite people to come to that. And that's a good way to get something started. But we were we were going at it a different way. We were trying to get into the neighborhood, spend time in the neighborhood, get to know people there with the you know central question being what where is God already present? Where is God already working in this space? And so the way we did that was we went to school meetings, you know, school board meetings. We went to neighborhood association meetings. We we went where people were in the context and and then we'd come back together and debrief and say, oh, yeah, we went to this meeting or we went to this park or we went to this event and here's what we learned and here's who we met. And over the course of a couple of years, we we started to discover the shape of this community, this new Christian community we were forming and what it was supposed to do. But it was a discovery-oriented process that took a lot of trial and error and, frankly, a lot of patience. Because I can remember some worship services in the middle of the summer where uh, we'd been going for a while and we barely had as many people as we started with. And it just seemed like, man, maybe this is failing. Maybe we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. But we had to have a little longer view. And and as we kept going, we we were able to say, oh, Here's here's the kind of niche that God has in mind for this for this congregation in this neighborhood. Um, and and then we continued to step into that and saw more people join us. So there's a lot of lessons from starting this new church, but that's a, a few from the kind of the origin of how that church started. Michael, one of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times that you wondered what God might be up to. And that isn't a question we hear very often for people who want to start a ministry or start churches. So I'm curious if you could share with us where that belief or conviction came from around God's activity in the neighborhood. Yeah, that's a great question. For me, that theological uh, assumption or question came from some of my training uh, at Luther Seminary, where I did a, a PhD years ago and really wanted to study the the missional movement, the missional theology that has been popular over the last 20 years or so. And really the the core tenet of a a missional approach to ministry and even to reading the Bible is that uh, God is the primary actor and God is, is moving in the story of scripture and in the story of our lives in the world. And our role, our, our very important role is to join whatever it is that God is doing. So when you apply that to to church planting, new ministry development, 
if you think about God as the primary actor, then naturally your first question is, well, what is the primary actor doing? You know, what what is it that God is saying, doing? What does God care about? And I think those are hard questions and they're a little bit unusual questions and they feel like, well, how would you ever know the answer to that question? Like who, who gets to say what God is doing or not doing or saying? And what we learned in just real practically was you, you're never a hundred percent sure what it is that God is doing or saying, or it doesn't seem like you are, um, but you can get more sure. And when you're starting something new, you have to realize like there's very little that's a hundred percent certain. And you learn as a leader or a participant, you know, Hey, my comfort level, if something is 40 or 50 or 60% sure, I'm ready to do it. You know, um, and you got to have a little bit of a bias towards action. So the theology of, of mission and thinking about God as a primary actor in the world gave shape to the practices of really looking for God in neighborhoods, in meetings, in relationships, in schools, and learning to process and talk about that as a community as we got started. So, Michael, you have a lot of experience helping other people start new ministries that are really impact uh, impacting their own communities. Can you share a few stories about some of those ministries and what you've learned walking alongside other ministry founders or starters? For sure. We have a program at Luther Seminary called the, the Seeds Project that has been in existence now for a few years. And we've had a number of fellows through that program who are um, who are all trying to start or tend some things that, that they've invested in and are trying to get going. So one that comes to mind is led by uh, a woman named Jennifer Oliver, who's in uh, Los Angeles. And she started something called the MANA Movement collaborative and you can you can look it up at manamovement.org if you want but it is um she's a food scientist phd food scientist who's also a minister and has been working on both the problem of food insecurity and food deserts in certain parts of LA and also how you form christian community start a new church that has a tie and a focus on this kind of food insecurity problem. And so, uh, man, she's done a tremendous job. It's been a really hard process in many ways to figure out how to bring together spiritual community and also a focus on these uh, kind of key issues that are happening in different communities. Um, but it goes together so well when a congregation and a spiritual ministry has a very practical focus, uh, social justice emphasis, because it highlights how the gospel of Jesus Christ um, isn't just about what we can gain from it individually, but also makes a concrete difference in the world. And uh, the church and the movement can be kind of um, seen together in some ways that are that are super positive. Another story from one of our Seeds fellows named Alma Cardenas, who's in uh, also in Southern California, uh, served as a pastor for many years and then felt called by God to try to elevate the voices of women of color in particular who have a writing gift and want to use their voice in some particular ways. And so she uh, started a, a ministry that was originally called Wine and Write, which highlighted the, the winemaking skills of persons of color in Southern California and other places, and also invited people to retreat settings where they could start finding their voice and um as writers and figuring out, you know, what it was that God was calling them to express to the world through their gift of writing. Many of them never having had the opportunity or have anybody sort of see them in a way that says, Hey, um, you can, you could probably do this and the world could really benefit from, from hearing from you. Um, so she's done a tremendous job of, of getting that ministry off the ground. The great thing about a lot of our, our seeds fellows and other people that I've worked with is that they seem to be bringing together the idea of starting a Christian community, getting Christian community formed in a number of different ways. Um, some of them more traditional church types of Christian communities, others a little bit more non-traditional, but they seem to all have a kind of other component to them that has a, a, a focus that's easy to talk about and is easy to draw other people in. And that can be uh, an issue like food insecurity. It could be and um, a question like uh, helping empower people who are writers that just haven't had the chance to do that, or it could be something else. But I see, seems like a pattern to me of how God is raising these leaders up 
where they have uh, both the ability to bring people around worship and around Christian identity, but also some kind of external focus that really helps clarify why they exist as a community. And it makes it easier for other people to see how they are participating in something that God is doing that's that's benefiting people outside of themselves. Great story, Michael. As you work with people wanting to start new ministries, what are some key steps leaders can take? Yes. Well, this is outlined some in the course we have online on Faith Lead, uh, shameless plug for the, the new ministries course. But um, the first step that's the most important step is to pray. You know, start start by asking God to show you what it is that God may want you to lead, what my God may want you to start, and be open to the a number of different ways that God may want to communicate that to you. Um, you want to start there and you want to keep paying attention to that question so that you don't kind of get off on this other path um, that that might not be in line with where the Spirit of God is leading you. And then, you know, there's a number of things that you can do to start out that are very helpful. And the first one is just to be really clear about what the ministry is. And as, as kind of simple as that might sound, I've talked to lots of leaders who will talk about their idea with incredible passion. You know, they're just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. We're doing this and we're thinking about this and we're going to engage these people. And I'll get to the end of the conversation and I still don't know what the ministry is. And so uh, you you have to have enough conversations with other people where you're clarifying like in, in just two sentences, you know, if you only have two sentences, what is it that this ministry is about? And once you've got it down to two sentences, you can certainly add more description and color and passion if you want, but make sure that your what, I call it the what in the class, you know, is, is clear enough and simple enough that when people hear it, they go, okay, that, that makes sense to me. Example. Like, I'm going to start a ministry that helps persons of color who have an interest in writing discover their voice. Okay, cool. I get it, right? If you can't do that in two sentences, you you need to start there. And then um, a couple other things that are helpful is defining, you know, who, who it is you want to be involved, both who you want on your team and also the, the people that you hope to impact with your ministry. Uh, you want to talk about why you're doing this in the first place, especially with the the initial group that uh, you might recruit to be on your team. You want to be able to tell them why this is important to you. Why is it important to you personally? Why is it important to do in the world? It needs to make a difference uh, beyond just kind of a, a passion area that any of us has. Um, it's great to know like where the ministry is going to take place. It's great to know the the core practices that the ministry is going to engage in to try to get started. Just like here's the kind of meetings we're going to have or the kind of practices we're going to do. It's great to sketch out um, what your funding source is going to be. That's usually the hardest question and the most intimidating for a lot of people. There's a um, maybe this is jumping ahead a little, but there is a kind of mistaken assumption that you need a ton of money to start stuff. And in my experience, if you have a ton of money, you're probably not going to succeed because having a bunch of money at the beginning will actually prevent you from discovering what's actually going to land with the people you're hoping to serve or engage with. And so having a little bit of money, enough to buy some time and, and enough, you know, supplies, resources, event space, whatever you need to try the thing that you're testing out, get a version going so that people can experience it and you can learn, is this actually going to work? Are people going to respond? Does anybody care about this? Doing sort of small, cheaper versions at the beginning to test and see is, is really helpful. And then finally, um, you know, clarifying some partnerships. Uh, don't think that you're the first person to do whatever it is that you feel called to do. Someone else probably does it already. They might be near to you. They might be far away. But look on the internet, see if you can find who's doing something similar uh, and have an open mind about how you might partner with other people. In ministry, we're not competing with each other. You know, we're all part of the kingdom of God. Um, shockingly or not, sorry, that was sarcastic. God sometimes draws people into the similar work from different places and, and you, you can partner with other people, learn from them, you know, gain experience that they've already, um, learned from that really helps accelerate your work. 
if you just have an open mind towards who you can partner with. So Michael, you've touched on this a bit already, but say more about common pitfalls that people can avoid when starting a new ministry. Yeah, that one I just mentioned, just to reiterate is, you know, don't don't start by thinking you have to raise tons and tons of money. Um, start by thinking you need a little money. And especially if you need some money to buy your own time, that's how I like to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it as staff. I like to think about it as buying some time for people to invest in leadership that helps you get started and get down the road to see what's possible. So um, you definitely need some funding. Um, but you don't need a lot of funding, not to test something new out. You might need more down the road. Um, and then this, a second common pitfall that I would mention is just that people are too vague about what they are trying to do and, and who it's going to impact. So um, you have to really be clear about who you're hoping to engage with and what you hope happens from those engagements especially if you're trying to help people see how they can contribute or participate on, on your team in your ministry, uh, vagueness will, will kill it pretty quickly. Um, and so you need to be clear and you need to try some things and see if uh, whatever you're doing makes an impact right away on, on whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So I'm curious, why do we need a lot of new ministries, right? Don't we have enough, like plenty of churches out there. Don't we have plenty of ministry structures already, right? In this landscape, right? Why do we need new ministries? Can you speak to that? Wow, I'm so glad you asked me that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we need new ministries for a whole bunch of reasons. And one of the common pushbacks to new ministries is, is I think while you're asking this question, you know, like people will say, well, we already have a lot of churches and some of those churches don't have that many people in them. Wouldn't it be smarter for us to just try to help more people get back in those churches before we go starting new ones? And that is really wrong. Like just uh, social science data says that's wrong. Theologically, I think it's wrong. I understand the sentiment, but uh, what we found is when you start new ministries, new churches, ministries out of existing churches, you get life in two ways. You get life with the group that's helping the new thing start. And you also get life with the folks who are sort of supporting it, making it possible, you know, launching it out of an existing congregation. And so we need new things in part to revitalize what exists and also to discover how to do ministry in new ways that you're forced to learn when you're starting something new and engaging with people who maybe aren't already engaged in ministry or church. So that's a key reason. Um, the second reason we need it, maybe the biggest reason, is just because God is doing new things. So, you know, if we're saying that, at least I'm saying that my theology is such that God is a creative God and God creates new things all the time and God has always created new things, then part of being the church is joining in the new things that God is that God is doing. So, it's sort of not determined by us that we would do new things. It's part of participating in God's mission. And then finally, we need new ministries just in part, especially in Western contexts, because there's just an astronomical number of people in our communities who are who will raise their hand and say that they are spiritually interested, spiritually curious people, but don't want to have anything to do with church. So what that says to me is people are interested in Jesus. People want to know God. Uh, as Christians, we have a particular way of understanding who Jesus is and, and who God is and what that means for our lives. And we need some new accessible ways for people to hear that story, to understand that identity of God that's understood by Christians, and to engage in a community that allows them to explore that. And if they feel like they can't do that in some of our traditional forms of church or forms of church that have existed, then we should probably start some new ones in order to make it accessible to people who don't feel welcome or don't feel comfortable in those other spaces. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, so I think there's a lot of good reasons. I, I, I sound a little flippant about it. Um, I don't mean to be. I have a ton of respect and have spent a lot of time in my life trying to help existing congregations discover their identity and 
really revitalize some of the ministries that they've invested in. And there's, that's really important. We should keep doing that. And it's very fruitful work in a lot of levels. It's just not mutually exclusive with starting new things. They can both happen. They can help each other. And we should be investing in both of those things all the time. Michael, you're the instructor for our on-demand course, How to Start a New Ministry. Can you share a little bit about the course, who it would be good for, what will people learn in it? Yes, I can. This course is a very meat and potatoes, practical, here's a step-by-step guide for shaping a, what I call a pitch, You know, a, a short description of what your new ministry is about and who might want to be involved in it in a variety of ways. And so I just kind of actually worked through the pieces just a minute ago uh, of all the different steps to creating a good summary, a good pitch for a new missional ministry. And so if you want to start something new, the course would be great because it will just tell you, hey, start with this, then describe this, do this little bit of work. It tries to outline those things in really accessible ways. And then by the end of the course, you'll have a really solid five to no longer than 10 minute uh, pitch to share other people uh, and get them involved in whatever your idea is. So especially if you have an idea and you haven't been able to shape it or articulate it in a way that allows it to kind of live and be accessible by other people, uh, this would be a really good course to, to help you move from, from A to B. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can learn more about our on-demand course for starting new ministries on faithlead.org or through the link in the show notes for today's episode. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Pivot Podcast. See you next week.